Former Chief Justice leads Independent Special Committee on Emergency. All business sectors allowed to reopen under strict SOP. And you're watching News at 10 with me, Brandon Lepore. 19 individuals have been appointed to the Independent Special Committee on Emergency 2021 with immediate effect. The committee was set up under Section 2 of the Emergency Essential Powers Ordinance 2021 and will advise the young Dipatuan Agong on the ongoing emergency and when it should end. In a statement released, the Prime Minister's Office said the National Security Council and the Prime Minister's Department will be secretariats for this committee. The Independent Special Committee will be led by former Chief Justice Tun Arifin Zakaria as chairman. Also part of the committee are former Chief Secretary to the Government Tan Sri Samsudin Osman, former Inspector General of Police Tan Sri Norian Mai and former Armed Forces Chief Tan Sri Zukifli Zainal Abidin. Others are former Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Mo Muhammad Taha Arif, Heart Surgeon, Tan Sri Dr. Yahya Awang, and Associated Chinese Chambers of Commerce and Industry of Malaysia President, Tan Sri Te Leong Yap. Also appointed are Cyberjaya University Pro Chancellor, Tan Sri Dr. R. Palin, former Deputy Public Prosecutor, Datuk Salihuddin Saidin, Police Mufti, Datuk Dr. Muhammad Azri Zainal Abidin, Public Health Expert, Datuk Dr. Andrew Kiu, and former Sabah State Secretary, Tan Sri Sukarti Wakiman. Among several politicians in the committee are Tan Sri Noh Omar, Datuk Sri Rohani Abdul Karim, Datuk Aziza Muhammad Dun, and Dr. Nick Muhammad Zawawi Saleh. Opposition Lawmakers, Datu Sri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail, Anthony Lok, and Datu Sri Dr. Zukifli Ahmad are also in the committee. The PMO said that Young Dipatan Agong also had consented to the appointments effective immediately. Now for the COVID-19 update, Malaysia's official virus tally nationwide reached 248,316 as another 2,764 cases were reported as at noon today. Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah said six of the new infections were imported, while the rest were local transmissions. Selangor melaporkan kes harian baru tertinggi iaitu sebanyak 862 kes bersamaan dengan 31.2%. Daripada jumlah ini sebanyak 668 kes iaitu 77.5% adalah daripada kluster-kluster dan saringan kontak rapat COVID-19 yang aktif dijalankan di lapangan. He added that 289 patients are currently being treated at the ICU, of which 127 requiring ventilator support. He also said that the country's recovery rate now stands at 79.2% after another 3,887 patients fully recovered and discharged from hospitals in the last 24 hours. This latest development brings the cumulative figure of active cases to 50,841. Meanwhile, the health DG said... There were 13 additional COVID-19 related deaths which pushed the total fatality count to 909. The Health Ministry also identified 12 new clusters, with 11 of them involving infections at workplaces. On another note, Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham said Malaysia has reported a decrease in the infectivity rate, or r not, from 1.16 to 0.91 yesterday. He explained that the number of daily cases is expected to remain flat for the next observation period before dropping as a result of the four-week movement control order. The government has decided to reopen all remaining business and retail sectors beginning tomorrow to ensure economic sustainability, especially among small businesses. Senior Minister for Security, Datu Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, said the premises can resume operations with strict standard operating procedures, SOPs, including disinfecting and cleaning their stores three times a day and making it compulsory for staff and customers to put on their face masks. Tetapi kebenaran yang diberikan bukannya dibuat sewenang-wenangnya 
kerana kita berpandukan kepada data-data yang diperolehi daripada agensi yang terlibat seperti KKM dan juga MKN. He said among the business allowed to reopen include fashion and accessory stores, vehicle accessory stores and cosmetic stores. The senior minister added that the full list of sectors is available on the National Security Council or the Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs Ministry websites. Only 34% or 2,455 foreign workers in Terengganu have undergone COVID-19 screening tests to date. Terengganu Social Security Organization SOXO Director Fariha J. Hussein said the other 4,868 foreign workers have yet to undergo the screening tests. Commencing further the matter, Fariha said that there are a total of 7,323 foreign workers currently working under 477 employers in various sectors throughout the state, such as agriculture, forestry, fishery and plantation, and Sokta hopes employers can immediately screen their workers before 28 February. Recently, Human Resources Minister Datu Sri M. Saravanan reportedly said that employers who fail to conduct screening tests for their foreign workers by 28 February could result in their workers' temporary work visit passes not being renewed. Meanwhile, Fariha said under the COVID-19 screening program for foreign workers, Soxo has appointed 10 panel clinics to carry out the screening tests, namely six in Kuala Trunganu, two in Kuala Nerus, and one each in Kamaman and Dungun. She said Soxo has also formed a task force with the Labour Department and Occupational Safety and Health Department as a proactive measure to ensure employers conduct screening tests for their foreign workers. She added that the task force would also cooperate with other relevant agencies to conduct spot checks on foreign workers' residences to ensure both employers and employees comply with the standard operating procedures. The Belize Sindam Forces ATM has thwarted an attempt to smuggle in drugs after seizing 402 kilograms of shabu estimated to be worth 16.08 million ringgit in Kampung Lubot Stol, Rantau Panjang, Kelantan yesterday. Aid Brigade Commander Brigadier General Zamzari Abu Hassan said a patrol team from the 4th Battalion Border Regiment found the drugs in 10 black sacks labelled as Guan Yin Wang brand tea, which were left by two suspicious individuals on the banks of Sungai Golo at about 10 a.m. Elaborating further, Brigadier General Zamsari said the two individuals, however, fled to the Thailand side by boat after realizing the presence of a patrol team and their identities could not be ascertained. He said all seized items will be handed over to the Pasir Mas Police Headquarters IPD for further investigation. Brigadier General Zamsari added that the seized items were believed to be smuggled from Thailand and it was the largest seizure carried out through the northern zone of Benteng of the Kelantan 8th Brigade Headquarters thus far. He said that with this seizure, it had a significant impact on the overall success of Op Benteng in strengthening the country's borders during the COVID-19 pandemic since last year. In addition, he also called on the locals and all relevant agencies to continue to share information and work together to prevent cross-border crime. Police arrested four men on suspicion of being involved in Bitcoin cryptocurrency mining. Not a suspect, aged between 22 and 39, were arrested in a raid at two premises near Batu Tiga, Jalan Gambang, Kuantan. Police also seized 159 units of Bitcoin server machines along with power supply. Pahang Deputy Police Chief Datu Muhammad Yusri Hassan Basri said the raid was conducted by the D-17 from the Pahang Police Headquarters together with the Pahang Tenaga National TNB SEAL Unit. Sebanyak 159 buah mesin Bitcoin iaitu 74 buah mesin di premis pertama dan 85 buah mesin di premis kedua telah dirampas. Siasatan mendapati suspek telah membuat penyambungan elektrik secara haram di kedua-kedua premis berkenaan. Anggaran kerugian elektrik secara kasar yang ditanggung oleh pihak TNB adalah sebanyak RM80,000 sebulan. Datuk Muhammad Yusri said in initial investigations revealed that the premises had been operating for three months, adding that the machines were believed to be shipped from China. The case is being investigated under Section 379 of the Penal Code for Electricity Theft and Section 427 of the same code for causing mischief. 
A 44-year-old father was charged at the Butterworth Sessions Court with sexually molesting his seven-year-old daughter between November last year and January this year. However, the accused pleaded not guilty after the charge was read before Judge Noor Hayati Muhammad Yunus. the girl's genitals in a bedroom of a house in Batuwa. He was believed to have committed the offence at about 10 p.m. between 15 November last year and 20 January this year. The charge was framed under Section 14, Subsection A of the Sexual Offences Against Children Act 2017, which carries a jail sentence of not more than 20 years with whipping and was read together with Section 16 of the same Act. The court allowed bail at 10,000 ringgit with one surety and the accused was ordered not to disturb the victim until the case is solved. The court also said 9 March for re-mention. A former civil servant was fined 40,000 ringgit at the Ipoh Sessions Court in Perak today after pleading guilty to two counts of receiving gratification for himself, totaling 25,500 ringgit three years ago. Judge S. Indra Nehru also ordered Herman Ibrahim, 46, a former cultural officer at the Perak State Secretary's office to serve eight months jail for each count if he failed to pay the fine. Herman pleaded guilty to the charge of receiving gratification of 7,500 ringgit from the company owner of Pro Explore Event Management, Muhammad Zulkibri Abdul Mutalib, on 15 November 2018, when he was serving as an agent to pair out Malaysia Games, Sukma. 2018 Secretariat. The accused also admitted to having received gratification of 18,000 ringgit from the owner of Shades Event Planner Company in relation to his official duties at the State Secretary's office on 18 November 2018. The court also ordered all assets seized from Herman, namely a laundrette and several pieces of jewellery, to be returned to him at the cost of 45,000 ringgit payable to the government of Malaysia. A woman was found hang at an eatery near the coastal line of Kuala Perlis. Kanga Police Chief Superintendent Wariku, in confirming this, said police received a report on the incident at 7.35 this morning from a passerby who was jogging in the area. Preliminary investigations reveal that the 60-year-old woman has told his son that she was going to a nearby shop to buy some vegetables. According to Superintendent Wari Q, investigations showed that there was no indication of foul play. The victim's body has been sent to the Tuan Ku Fauzia <laughs> Hospital in Kanga for post-mortem. To come, strong pent up demand helps our Asia improve key operational metrics. Stay with us. But First Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dato Sri Hishamuddin Tun Hussein, held a constructive and productive meeting with the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the United Arab Emirates, UAE, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed bin Sultan Al Nahyan, on Monday. Both ministers expressed their satisfaction at the current state of bilateral relations between Malaysia and the UAE and agreed to foster greater cooperation between the two close partners, especially in boosting economic opportunities as both countries are focused on a strong and resilient economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The two ministers discussed important initiatives under four priority areas of cooperation in the post-pandemic era, namely trade and investments, agriculture and food security, health, as well as diplomatic exchanges. The working visit has provided a new impetus to the strong and brotherly ties between Malaysia and the UAE. The UAE is one of Malaysia's main trading partners. In 2019, total trade between Malaysia and the UAE was valued at 6.43 billion US dollars. The UAE is also Malaysia's largest export destination and second a largest source of import in the West Asia region. Given Malaysia's strategic location in the Southeast Asian region, Malaysia is committed to being the gateway 
way for the UAE to enter the Southeast Asian market, which is home to over 650 million people. Upon returning to Malaysia, Dr. Sri Hishamuddin will undergo mandatory quarantine, adhering to the COVID-19 Standard Operating Procedures, SOP, as prescribed by the Ministry of Health, MOH. The government is optimistic that the setting up of the National Entrepreneurship Development Council, MPKN, can help Malaysia to realize its goal in becoming an outstanding entrepreneurial nation by 2030. Entrepreneur Development and Cooperatives Minister, Dr. Sri Dr. Wan Junaidi Tuanku Jaffa, said the council has put a target to help the micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs, to contribute to up to 50% to the national gross domestic product as compared with the 38.9% percent achieved in 2019. In a release statement, he said MPKN will act as a communication platform between the federal and state governments, and the corporation is expected to further strengthen the current entrepreneurial ecosystem across all levels. He added that MPKN is expected to play a leading role in coordinating policy and entrepreneurship development of the nation and will set the scope of cooperation between the federal and the state governments. He said the council will also recommend integrated strategic initiatives and measures to holistically address issues challenges and obstacles faced by entrepreneurs of all levels. Air Asia Group Berhad is navigating its recovery phase exceptionally well as key operational metrics improve in December 2020 in comparison to September 2020. Now this is shown by the 31% increase notably in passengers carried by Air Asia Thailand, doubling of passengers carried by Air Asia Philippines and number of passengers carried by Air Asia Indonesia which multiplied by a whooping 11 times. In a statement released, the group said AirAsia Malaysia MAA closed the fourth quarter with 834,934 passengers carried on a healthy 72% load factor. Despite the setback in October and November given the re-implementation of interstate travel restrictions. It said following the easing of restrictions in December, strong pent-up demand positively translated into an immediate pickup in domestic travel. Post-COVID, the group expects to benefit from a leaner and optimized airline operation established in 2020, concentrating on recovering the most profitable and popular routes while exploring opportunities to gain market share. AirAsia added that the improvements signified a solid domestic rebound for air travel demand across the group's key operating markets. Institute Ko Sahawana Nagara Berhad in Sken has put a target to train 15,000 participants through the entrepreneurship training programs this year with a total allocation of 12 million ringgit. Chief Executive Officer Mohammad Firdaus Asaruddin said five new industries would also be introduced through the Inkscan Pumiputra Business Coaching IBBC program. Perhatian program yang kita jalankan pada tahun 2020 Kita mengenal pasti bahawa Ramai usahawan mempunyai masalah pembangunan produk Sebagai satu aspek Jadi pada tahun ini Kita memberi perkenan Banyak latihan-latihan baru Untuk membantu usahawan dalam aspek pembangunan produk Alhamdulillah Iskan juga akan menawarkan 5 industri baru Bagi program Iskan Bumi Putra Business Coaching kami Iaitu industri penjagaan warga emas Industri sukan dan tinggi rasa, pusat tuition, praktika dan khidmat nasional. He added the entrepreneurs that were involved in the IBBC and Bumiputra Business Enhancement Program have accumulated 14.5 million ringgit of total sales. Inskin has trained more than 78,000 entrepreneurs via 390 programs with an allocation of 12 million ringgit last year. But first, facing hard times and failures will make one stronger and lead one to greater success. Malaysian squash great Dato' Nicole David crowned the World Games' greatest athlete of all times last week, said despite having a lot of highs in her career to become the most decorated squash star, it was the lows she faced that really made her who she is. 
They call the 181 Professional Squash Association PSA World Tour titles in her 20-year professional career said the defeat she faced played a crucial role in her growth to emerge as an icon in the sport. She added that you have to believe in yourself and not see failures as something bad and give up but needs to come back stronger and work harder to realize your true potential. Nicole plans to launch her own foundation in Pulau Pinang from a second base in Bogota, Colombia next month. According to her, the foundation's purpose, which has been two years in the making, is to motivate and empower the youth and young women. I believe that Malaysian squash has so much potential and I'm pleasantly surprised when I was back in Malaysia to see so many juniors coming through and I think I believe there's 800 over kids all around Malaysia uh, that are playing squash and so much talent I saw in them and they are all gunning to do something good and so I believe there will be a lot of future champions coming through for Malaysia definitely in squash. Nicole tallied a whipping 318,943 votes in an online poll to take home the award conducted by International Sporting Association, the World Games. The Pulau Pinang last achieved everything possible, including eight world championship titles and unprecedented record 109-month reign as the world's number one and being the most successful Asian Games athlete with seven gold medals in total. With that, we conclude this evening's news at 10. In our top story, former Chief Justice leads Independent Special Committee on Emergency. Join us for more updates at 12.30 p.m. tomorrow. Till then, I'm Ranella Paul. Stay tuned to Salaran Barita RTM and have a good night.